All right, Claire. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a speaking into your heart that breaks you. Somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Good morning, Lighthouse. Hey, it's good to see you this morning, family. I am so happy that you are here. If you're watching online, I'm so happy you're here as well, whether you're in Texas, Alabama, Indiana, that's just a few of the places that people watch. Uh, But hey, here's the thing. Today is a day that we get to come together as a community of believers and declare the name of Jesus Christ. That's a good day, isn't it? I want to share with you a story this morning about a time that I got lost while I was driving. Here's the thing, I, I pride myself that for the most part, I think I have a pretty decent sense of direction. It, moving to Colorado made it easy, especially in the front range, because like you always know where the mountains are, that's how you get anywhere, right? And then you go like camping in the mountains and you're surrounded by them, you're like, I don't know where I'm going. Uh, but I, I was driving in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was going to a meeting, uh, and uh, I, I happened to be in one of those places in life where my phone was dead and like the the cord in my car that's supposed to ensure that doesn't happen did not work. So I didn't have a GPS with me and it'd been like over a decade since I've owned a Garmin. We we remember those. Um, And, and I, I was in a place where I had, I'd been this way before. And in general, I knew where I was supposed to go, but the problem is I took a wrong turn. And if you've ever been driving in downtown Atlanta, you know that you'll go, you know, for the most part in, in, in around the cities, like or, or around, around like the skyscrapers, it's straight, but then you kind of get past that and into like these historic neighborhoods and what road was once straight now all of a sudden has this S curve in it and you're no longer going north and south. Now you're going like northeast. And so in, in my mind, while I make the wrong turn, I'm going, okay, I know that I can stop and turn around and go back to where I I, I made the turn and get on the right road. I know, I'm pretty sure how to get there from there, but I don't really want to waste my time with turning around. What if I could just find a cross street that would take me over? Except I happened to be on one of these streets that wasn't straight. And so after meandering and turning and having no idea which direction I was going, I turned on a street that was not the cross, right cross street. And now I am hopelessly lost in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't have GPS. I don't have a phone or a charger that works. And I don't know how to get to where I need to go. I knew that eventually if I kept driving, I'd hit one of the major highways that goes around Atlanta and then I could figure out where I was. By the time I got to the meeting, I was half an hour late. All because I didn't want to waste time by turning around. Because I thought that I knew the way and the way that I knew would probably be the best way. Right? This is reminiscent of a verse in Proverbs chapter 14. It says this, there is a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death. Obviously Solomon had, when he wrote this, had been in Atlanta traffic, (laughs) right? There's a way that seems right to man, right? That is you and I, there is something in, in us that we think, hey, this is the best way. You don't have to, you don't have to go far before you realize that you put two opinionated people in the room and they have a disagreement. The problem isn't the fight, it's that they both are convinced that they're right. There's a way that seems right to us, but in the end, it leads to death. In the greater context of this is I'm convinced that one of the greatest tools of Satan is the deception that following our own way is best. That, oh, I got this. Because the truth is, when it comes to salvation, we cannot find salvation by doing what we think is best. We just can't. You can't make the best decisions and end in you being saved. You are incapable of saving yourself. I am incapable of saving myself. We are all wholly dependent upon the work of Jesus Christ to find salvation. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, stick with me today. 
Because there's a truth at the end of this that is the best truth that you could ever hear. But we cannot find salvation by doing what we think is best. Best Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us is immune to sin. You're not immune to sin. You're not immune to sin. You're not immune to sin. I'm not immune to sin. If you're watching online, you're not immune to sin. We all sin. None of us is God and doing what we think is best is still not the best because God is best. And so if we just follow the way that we think is best, we will end up away and eternally separated from God. We have to make the decision to sacrifice our self interest to follow God as our savior and Lord. That's why Jesus came. As we've been talking about this concept of prayer over the last four weeks, right? We've talked about these principles that lead to a transformational prayer life, right? Praying in a way that's going to change you or change the world around you. And we talked about all these different principles. We talked about adoration is the first one that we talked about. Submission, submission is, uh, if adoration is, is our worship of God, submission is this idea that we're going to align our hearts to his will. And then we, we talked about, Uh, Last week, we talked about petition. These are the things that we pray for God, right? Things, the requests that we have, interceding for other people. This week, we're talking about this concept that is right up there that's just as fun as submission. It's repentance. And we see that Jesus teaches us this prayer. Matthew 6, chapter, or chapter 6, we'll start in verse 9, right? It says, this is Jesus giving instruction. It says, when you pray, then pray like this, our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's your adoration. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's submission. And give us this day our daily bread. There's the petition. And here we go today. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Some of your Bibles may say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or forgive us our transgressions. And it's all around this concept of forgive us of the things that separate us from you. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive the sins of other people. This idea of repentance that we're going to talk about today, this is not, this is not something that is... Uh, as simple, I think, as sometimes our culture makes it out to be. We see this all through the New Testament, right? Even at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he's being baptized by by his cousin John, right? We hear this sermon that John is preaching, this sermon of repentance in the wilderness. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But repentance doesn't mean that you're sorry. It doesn't mean an apology. Right? I think that we, we, we kind of boil it down to kind of this oversimplified definition of what repentance is. The word to repent actually means to change directions. It means to turn, right? Repentance then is turning away from sin. It doesn't mean we're sorry. It doesn't mean changing. It means changing directions. And here's the truth. I think we need to change directions. We need to do that because our way, right? We read this in Proverbs 14. If we follow just our way, it leads to death. So let's turn and change directions away from that. And I want to show you how and what we see in in scripture and in this prayer this morning. Repentance is turning away from sin, right? Praying, forgive us our debts, recognizes that our wrong, it recognizes our wrongs and accepts our need to turn away from them. Here's the hard part, the first hard part today, right? You aren't always right. Anybody watch Happy Days back in the day? Anybody ever see what the Fonz, like when he get to the point where he had to admit that he was wrong? He would go, I was... Sounds like a car not being able to start, right? I was wrong. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We like being right. But when we, Jesus tells us to pray, forgive us our debts, right? It is recognition of our wrongs and acceptance of our need to turn away from them. And if prayer, and if the prayer of submission is aligning to the heart of Jesus, then the prayer of repentance aligns our character to be more like Jesus. Anybody not want to be more like Jesus in this room? Okay, because if you don't want to be more like Jesus, you may not be in the right spot. 
right? <laughs> like that's us, right? We are pursuing this idea of becoming more like Christ. In 2 Chronicles 7.14 is this passage that we've been using to illustrate these same principles of, of prayer transformation. And in this, if we remember, right, it's the dedication of the temple, right, to God from the people of Israel. They're dedicating this, saying this is the house of worship. This is where we will worship. And this is where the spirit of God is going to dwell. And in 2 Chronicles 7, at the end of this dedication, we see God speaking to, to King Solomon. He says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. God says this to Solomon in response though, to a prayer that Solomon prayed in the dedication ceremony. And if 2 Chronicles 7 is God's response and this promise and then 2 Chronicles 6 is this prayer of dedication and request of God that Solomon gives at the dedication ceremony. And I want to show you just a little bit. It's a long prayer, but I just want to show you just a few verses of that this morning. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 24. If your people Israel, and remember, this is Solomon asking this to God. If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you. Okay, stop there, right? Solomon knows something about the character of the people of Israel. You see, they had this problem of always needing repentance because as much as they would be, were the people of God and followed God, their hearts were easily pulled away by the distractions of the world. And so he says, right, he knows this. He goes, if your people Israel defeated before the enemy because they've sinned against you, he's going, God, if you allow Israel to be defeated because they've sinned, but they turn again and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave them and to their fathers. Then he gives a second example, right? When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. If they pray towards this place, towards this temple where your, where your presence will dwell and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin, when you afflict them, then hear from heaven, forgive their sins of your servant, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land for which you have given to your people as an inheritance. So these two examples, Solomon's going, look, when the people sin and they lose the fight because of it, but then they turn and face you again, forgive them. And then when they sin and you bring drought to the land, but they turn away from their sin. Forgive them and bring rain. Right? These verses, right? These, this passage that, that, that Solomon prays to God is God, if the people can walk out repentance, hear them and forgive them. And then the next chapter, God promises that he will do just that, right? Repentance is important, it's vital, it's key. And turning away from our sins is one of the requirements of repentance, but it's not just turning away from our sins. In fact, I think too often we think of this idea that, well, if we're not facing, if we turn away from sin, right, we're facing God, right? It's just this one easy sweeping action, except I think it's more than that because repentance is turning away from sin, but it also means turning to God. I think often we oversimplify the concept and assume there's only two paths to follow in life, either the path of sin or the path of God. Make no mistake, we can turn away from sin to another sin. In my ministry career, I've had the opportunity to work uh, with several uh, men and women who've struggled with addiction and have sought health. And there, there's something interesting, and I'm trying not to overgeneralize, but one of the things that I've noticed about many who have, are trying to overcome uh, substance addictions is that many of them smoke cigarettes. And when you, we talk to them, they know that smoking cigarettes is not healthy for them, but, but it's not near as bad as like heroin or meth. And so instead of doing those addictions, they take the little addiction that they can. Here's the thing. Neither one are healthy. Is one less bad than the other? Sure. But neither one of them are healthy. We can turn away from sin to another sin. It doesn't mean we're turning to God. Repentance is turning, but true repentance is turning away from sin and towards God. 
In fact, Solomon's prayer that we just read in, in 2 Chronicles 6.24, the first one speaks about turning and facing God before it, the second section turns about, talks about turning away from sin. Look at this. I'm skip a couple of slides. I'll go back to them. I'll skip a lot of slides, right? If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, they then, and they turn again and acknowledge your name. Right? It's turning, it's ta- this one's talking about who they turn to. It's not just turning away from sin. It matters who you turn to. But when God prompts repentance, and this is what I love about the bigness of God, is he draws us in to righteousness. He draws us into right relationship with him. You know, often I, I think that the, the testimonies that I've heard about people turning away from their sin, they're first prompted by God. And there's almost a turning to God. It doesn't really make sense with us, with our minds, because we turn, we, we can only face one direction. So we turn from sin to God, but there's almost this prompting of turning to God that really pulls us into that act of repentance of turning away from sin. But it's more than just turning away from sin. It's turning into right relationship and, ta- and, and righteousness being right before God. And look, there are many people who I think struggle with this idea because they don't, they're ashamed of what their sin is. It's secret. We don't want people to know our deep, dark secret. We're living with this sin and we, we don't let it go. Even sometimes we want to let it go, but we're afraid what's going to happen if we confess this sin. We're afraid what's going to happen if we tell other people this sin. Let me tell you, first of all, God already knows your sin and being in right relationship with him is greater than any shame you could ever experience. And so when we turn away from sin into righteousness, if shame is the thing that keeps us from repenting, It's keeping us from being in right relationship with God. And I promise you, it's not easy, but it is worth it. Repentance is turning towards God for forgiveness and restoration. We'll talk more about the peace of restoration next week. But repentance is also more than than turning away and forgiveness turning to God, right? There's this this sense of activity in repentance. It's not something that's passive. It is something that's active. In Matthew 6, 9, at the beginning of the prayer, Jesus says, and when you pray, right? And there's this, this, these three words. And when you pray, actually, I said four words. (laughs) There are three words. When you pray, right? This word, this phrase is present and future oriented. This is what I mean by that, right? Jesus instructs us to build repentance into our daily prayer life every day. It's for today and for tomorrow. That's when we should walk out repentance. And some of us, I think, have been convinced that, well, we we repented once. We prayed to ask Jesus in our heart. That was our repentance. But don't forget, it's this instruction on how to pray is something that Jesus instructs us to do every single day. It's not a, hey, when you decide to follow me, pray this one prayer and you got it, you repented. In fact, the biggest myth about repentance is that you only do it once. And so if you've only really made the conscious decision to turn away from sin one time, maybe it's time to examine your heart this morning. Maybe it's time to Examine what are the other things in your life you need to repent of. Because Jesus didn't say do this one time. He instructs us to do this on a present and future basis. The other concept of of repentance being active is it doesn't, doesn't stop. It continues forward just in a new direction. That's what I mean by that. Have you ever been in a car and driving and really rapidly changed directions? Like, I mean, the U-turn, the where like the hubcap flies off, 
right? And it may seem a little dangerous, and you're like, maybe the car's going to roll. But if it doesn't roll, right, you are going in the other direction significantly faster. If you'd have stopped in a three-point turn and like, okay, now I'm facing the right direction, put in gear, okay, now I'm going to build up to speed. Right? Meanwhile, while you're doing that, the guy who like did the screeching U-turn is a mile down the road already. Repentance isn't a stop and pivot. It's a U-turn. When I was growing up in the deep south, uh, what you did on Sunday afternoon was you watched NASCAR, right? That's just what we did. Uh, we would go to church on Sunday, and then we would watch NASCAR slash, NASCAR slash take a nap in the afternoon. I don't really watch NASCAR anymore. I haven't literally since I moved out of my parents' house. But for, like, growing up, that's what you did on Sunday afternoon. And it's always fascinating to me with race car drivers how they, they spend so much time studying turns because it matters how you turn to not lose momentum. Right, the, the, the harsher the turn, the, the more speed you lose. But with repentance, when we talk about it being active, we're not saying, okay, we're headed towards sin, stop. We're, okay, there's God, let's go. You don't lose the momentum, right? You're progressing through life. Instead of just stopping, you're turning to God. Let the momentum of your forward desire for something be turned away from sin and towards God. Run after him with full abandon. Let the hubcap fly off, screech the tires, pursue God without losing the speed of the pursuit. Repentance is active. It's a U-turn, it's not a pivot. Repentance is also accepting forgiveness. On a mission trip uh, to the Bahamas, I, I was with a group of people and we met a man and asked if we could pray for him. He thanked us. He even told us what we were doing was really important. He quoted some scripture, but then he declined our request to pray with him because he informed us that he had made the decision to reject Jesus. And when we asked him, he said that the reason he chose to reject Jesus is that he didn't deserve for his sins to be forgiven. You know the difference between me and that man? Is we both have the same conclusion that our, our, our sins don't deserve to be forgiven. But because of that, he chose to reject Jesus because of how foul he, he thought of himself. Me, I recognize that I need Jesus and there's no other thing that I could possibly find as the solution. Because he was right. There is nothing we can do to save ourselves. There is nothing we can do that deserves the salvation Jesus provides us. But following Jesus is the only way to fulfill the purpose you and I were created for. But, but we acknowledge this on a Sunday morning, but here's what we problem. We don't acknowledge this when we go out into the world. Right? We, we pursue our careers or our educations. We want to be great. We want to influence people. Right? We want people to look at us and see how great we are. We're searching for a purpose in everything but Jesus. And I don't care what profession you are. I don't care what you studied. True purpose in life is not found by what you do, but who, what you surrender to who did everything for you. You want to find your purpose? It's not on LinkedIn. Your purpose is found in who you recognize as your Lord. Our lives are so finite in terms of all eternity. And we can spend all our efforts trying to be great in this small speck of our existence. But if we don't find that true purpose in Jesus, we'll spend the rest of eternity lacking that significance and purpose and separated from God. And hear me, I don't think it matters. In fact, I don't, it's not that I don't think. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you look like, dress like, or smell like. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You are worthy of forgiveness because Jesus shed his blood for you. That if you confess your sins and you trust in him, you can find forgiveness. 
There was a a hospital that was built in London. It was for, uh, for it was a mental health hospital. It was built um, in the early 1900s. And once when touring the hospital, a member of parliament was asking a doctor, hey, what would it take to, for these people to find health? And he goes, most of our beds would be emptied if the people in them could just figure out how to forgive themselves. We struggle with forgiveness. We struggle sometimes with allowing ourselves to be forgiven. But hear me, it is the only path for purpose and salvation in life is that we confess, we receive the forgiveness Jesus has for us. Because it's the only pathway to righteousness. It's the only pathway to being right with him. Accepting the forgiveness of our sins is a lifestyle that transforms us to be more like Jesus. We already admitted that we wanted to be more like Jesus. So receiving that forgiveness is part of it. But here's maybe the most challenging part. Because repentance is also offering forgiveness. The part of the prayer is we forgive our debtors can be the most challenging aspect of our prayer lives. You see, in our culture, we spend, we've spent 2,000 years trying to prove Jesus wrong on this one. We think that we can have a relationship with God and love him while living a life hating certain people. Right? And, and maybe it's people who've hurt us. Maybe it's, it's people who've hurt someone we love. Maybe it's someone who's fought with us. Maybe it's a boss or a former spouse. Maybe it's a talking news figure that we never see. Maybe it's someone in Washington, D.C. But we talk about how much we love God, yet we spew words of hate to other people. Well, look at what 1 John 4 says. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. You can't coexist with loving God and hating somebody else. It is not within it. Jesus says that they will, you, they will know you're my disciples because you love one another. And the truth is that this is so much easier to hate than it is to love. It's easier to resent than it is to forgive. But we forgive because we were forgiven. And the person that we struggle, that we harbor bitterness with, is the person that we struggle with hating, that person God values so much that he sent his son to die for them. And he loves them with all of who he is just as much as he loves you. And I know this is not an easy message and I know it's not a fun or warm or fuzzy one because I know people have been hurt. I know people in this room have been hurt by others and that you don't want to forgive them. Maybe you're living with the, 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 the mindset that oh, I can't forgive them. They haven't asked for forgiveness. They're not sorry. Hear me though. Forgiveness doesn't care about how the offender feels but how you release the offense. Hear me, somebody, it's time to release the offense. Because when we live in unforgiveness, we're choosing to be consumed by bitterness. And it's time to let go. Also, hear me very clearly. What I'm not saying is that you should continue to live in an abusive relationship. You should continue to have people in your life that you forgive while they continue to hurt you. I don't think that is healthy. I don't think that's how God intends you to live. And if you need to get yourself out of abusive situation and into health and work on forgiveness and need help, we would love to help you. It's easy to hold on to our hurt. It's hard to forgive. It's hard to let go especially when that, that bitterness is attached to personal hurt and torment. But we were forgiven so that we could learn how to forgive. And it doesn't matter how the other person feels. 
the most powerful thing you can do to the situation is release the offense because you're claiming the name of Jesus over that. You're forgiving because you were forgiven. There's another aspect of this being a daily prayer because sometimes today we can go, okay, I can forgive today, but we pick up that offense again tomorrow. And again, you pray the next day, I can forgive today. And sometimes it takes day after day after day after day after day of choosing to forgive. But hear me, we've got to turn away from our bitterness. We've got to turn away from our hurt. We've got to turn away from the things that we're grabbing hold of that is keeping us from walking in right relationship with God. The most powerful thing we can do is release the offense. Because forgiveness doesn't care about how the offender feels. It has nothing to do with them. They have their own relationship with God that they've got to work out. You and I, right? You have your relationship with God. I've got mine. I can't repent for you. I can't make you feel sorry for something you've done and, and lead into repentance. Only God can call you into repentance that turns towards him. The best I can ever do is say, hey, there's a God that wants you to face him and turn away from your sin. You've got to make the choice to turn to him. But I promise you when you do that, it can be life transformation. When we hold on to unforgiveness, and harbor bitterness and resentment. It's justification that we can determine someone's value and worth of salvation. And you and I don't have that right. Only Jesus has that right. And that value, he's already determined it enough to die for you and the person who's hurt you. Don't live in the hurt. Release the offense. As we've been walking through this over this prayer series, right? One of the one of the things that we've challenged you with is, hey, at the end of this, we want to challenge you to spend an hour in prayer, and it's been building up every week. And this week, we're adding uh, another one on. That after next week, if you take, oh, we have all these pages in the back, right? If you take all the pages and sit down, it should last an hour. Right? It's an hour of prayer. And here's my request: this week, I need you to carve out. I think this week it's like. 48-ish minutes. I need to carve about 48 minutes of your week. It's not that much time. Just 48 minutes. Walk through these prayer processes. Here's the thing I promise that it will do. Draw you closer to God. And it will help you walk into that right relationship. So if you haven't done it yet, it's not too late to start. Let me also say this. If you're sitting in the room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, you've never chosen to turn away from any sin to follow him. If you're watching online and you've never made that, that conscious decision, let me encourage you, don't let today pass you by without choosing to follow him. After service, we'll have our prayer team up front. And if you want to make that decision to follow him, we would love to pray with you. The other thing is this, if you're in the room and there's any aspect of repentance that you're struggling with or you need help with, or you just need prayer for, we would also love to pray for you for that. Because it's not worth holding on to that and moving away from God. Let's turn away from sin and let's turn to him. Let's let our repentance be active. Let's walk in forgiveness that he's given us and, and be the example of how we forgive others. Father, we thank you that you are worthy of our worship, that you sacrificed your son so that if we confess our sins, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I pray that repentance is a lifestyle.
that we live, that we walk in every single day, that we build into our prayer lives every single day. As we submit to you and align our hearts to your will, I pray that we repent from the things that pull us away from you. And God, I pray for each and every one of us that you make clear and evident right now what those things that we need to turn away from are. And that if you're in this room and you need to repent, now's the time to pray to turn away from sin and turn to righteousness. So Father, we thank you. We love you. Draw us into deeper relationship with you to be more like Jesus. It's in your name that we pray.